Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the CDL Podcast channel. Uh, pretty excited to get into this episode today because it's the first and last episode of the week before Vanguard comes out. Uh, next time we record an episode, Vanguard will be out. We'll have lots to talk about, be able to talk about hopefully a lot of the good things in the game and not too many negatives. Hopefully see some glimpse at what rank play is going to look like since they've given us a little teaser. Uh, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe on the YouTube video if you're watching it on this platform. And if you're watching on the audio platforms, make sure to drop a follow and come check us out on Twitter and YouTube. The links will be in the description of the YouTube video as well as on the Anchor page. Before we get into this one and we uh, see how Kyle's doing, I want to give a shout out to all of you on YouTube here. We hit 300 subscribers uh, from our last video. That's something awesome to see because obviously every every subscriber is a cool milestone to hit because it's just growing the community more and more people to talk call of duty with which is basically why this podcast was started more people to talk to call of duty with i mean heck i started the podcast by myself and we've got a co-host now and that's something that would have never been possible without uh, creating the channel and just starting to talk to new people and branch out so shout out to all of you guys uh, i know kyle and i both really appreciate the support especially all the new commenters we've had so many new people commenting giving feedback what they think we could do better which obviously we're going to take all that and try to apply it because we can always get better uh, and we've really enjoyed the support so thank you guys so much uh, and before we get into the news kyle how you doing today doing pretty well uh you know like that that like inner demon in me is kind of growing uh <laughs> uh j just because i want to see how many uh gas we're gonna have in the first uh 24 hours of vanguard <laughs> being released um like I said, I'm probably not going to be playing the first week or so, uh, at least. So I, I just want to, you know, I, I, I kind of like, I'm an agent of chaos. I, I thrive on like, you know, the <laughs> whole, uh, when things get, you know, thrown up in the air, people are going to be complaining that there's no third competitive game mode. I'm going to be like, just sitting there cackling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you know you're gonna be laughing maybe, at my expense is what i'm hearing yeah maybe i'm just a sycophant or like, <laughs> you know, um but yeah so I, i'm just looking forward to uh what this uh the end of the week will bring awesome i mean i'm really looking forward to it i'm on the opposite end uh i have off work on friday i'm the kid that would always do super well in school so that i would have an excuse to skip school the day that cod came out my parents were nice enough to say hey if all your grades are good which they they always were up there, so they let me stay home for COD, and I took off work this Friday because I am planning to be a degenerate and play all night on Thursday night. <laughs> I'm ready for it. Uh, we have our list of news we want to talk about, but you actually mentioned something um, that I wanted to talk about a little bit before maybe we get into the news because it's also news. It's about GAs. Uh, I know you're a, you love to look at the chaos of GAs and see how they're created, but I was watching The Flank, and I heard... Oh, who was it methods or crim or clay it was one of those guys that was on there as a guest from the one about a week ago and they said something about the ga community towards the end basically fell apart because a lot of people that helped run it from the teams were on the bench which i'm assuming mainly means slasher and accuracy yeah i would, I would think uh but that's interesting because like they always talk about how they're not the ones that like run the ga community and don't make them but apparently the committee just fell apart which is interesting, but I think it also could be due to the fact that they're probably the two that are mature and motivated and organized enough that they get the talks going. But I thought that was pretty interesting that that's why we didn't see any like super new GAs towards the last few months of the game because those guys were on the bench. I'm assuming they mean them at least. Yeah, I I would just say that probably like from from what I remember the the meta stayed pretty uh, pretty steady for the. You know, once they got the M4 out yeah. and they they got the QBZ out, uh, subsequently, mm -hmm. uh, we were pretty much stuck on like a one to two Krig and seventy four U meta, um, and there wasn't really too many uh, tuning adjustments with like damage or like bullet velocity or anything crazy like that. So no, um, I think that was the you know, main reason why we didn't see too many GAs, and then obviously, like, you know, all those DLC Warzone guns were, uh, you know, those aren't, those are rarely allowed into competitive play anyway, so, um, yeah, that's probably the reason, but, uh, yeah, it was just kind of interesting, and, uh, made me chuckle a little bit when he was like, yeah, we were all on the bench, and, you know, there was really no GA committee, and, uh, yeah, so that's kind of, kind of funny. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty, pretty hilarious how they talked about that like 
I mean, it makes sense. Not that there was a lot of things that had to be G8. I just thought it was funny because who knows if it was even because Slasher and Accuracy were on the bench, but I just thought it was so funny that those were two of the guys that got benched and they're like, yeah, the people that always run it are on the bench. It's kind of the meme that like it's the Slasher and Accuracy World League and they run all the GAs. It was just something I thought was pretty funny to talk about, but we can get into our other news we had actually down for it. Oh, the first thing we had down uh, was... The BO2 throwback tournaments, obviously Envoy, Pristini, Gunless, and Arcides defeated the the old Cole squad, Clay, Krim, Teep, and Aches in the finals. We both said that we didn't really have too much time and didn't watch much of this tournament, so we can't really like speak to how the finals actually went. But I think it's just interesting that that complexity squad with two guys like Teep and Aches who haven't played, I mean, for Teep, he hasn't really played any actual like pro competitive COD since like the Black Ops 3 year and Aix who hasn't really played since the very beginning of MW uh, and they still come out here and beat a bunch of current pros and current like Warzone grinders and stuff in this tournament and find a way to make it all the way to the finals uh, that's kind of shows how dominant they probably actually were at that game that they were able to just come out with two guys who barely play uh, any actual like arcade shooter COD not Warzone and make it pretty far yeah, I really just, uh, you know, I watched a few, like, stream highlights. Uh, I think, like, yeah. Envoy posted a YouTube video. Um, the uh, the Envoy, uh, Gunless, Prasini, Arcity's team came from losers. So they, they had to rattle off two. Uh, oh, they had to reset it? Yeah, they, they, they won 6-0. <laughs> you know, oh they 3 0 3 0 But, you know, there I think there was some, uh, you know, uh, I think Complexity had been iced pretty hard. Um Oh yeah, 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 I saw Aix say something about that. Like yeah. he's just like, yeah, we had to sit for a couple hours, but like, I mean, he didn't really care. It's just a tournament for fun. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, just seeing like how the gameplay looked, and you know, there's no crazy like spider cat, you know, slide canceling and stuff. It's, yeah. it's a lot based on like your positioning and gun skill, and um, you know, call outs and knowing where the enemies coming from and winning your gunfights um it's just a, it was just kind of fun to see that style of gameplay again um obviously we we like seeing the uh the movement aspect i think that's a really um entertaining yeah um, for the viewer perspective fa- yeah facet to the game um but you know that uh whatever engine they you know they were able to to download this on the PCs it looks really good and mm-hmm. um you know, I, I'm just, I, uh, and then I think Clay was like, you know, we got to get a, a Black Ops Two beer league going. I, I think that was, uh, that was a really funny thing. And uh, yeah, you know, maybe we'll see some more, um, you know, throwback tournaments. Uh, obviously not during the season, but uh, you know, I, I think Hitch always does a good job putting on these, you know, charity tournaments, and and the money goes to yeah, the yeah. cause. So, yeah, it's, yeah, I, I hope he does it every year because it's always something that is entertaining especially when they do like the black ops 3 ones for me they're super entertaining obviously black ops 2 is as well and like you said i believe that it goes to like a men's mental health charity so a great cause uh obviously one pretty personal to hitch losing his dad from suicide so it's always pretty awesome to see how the community rallies behind him and supports him and honestly gives a lot of money every year he raises an absurd amount of money like i think it's over like i think the goal for them this year was like thirty thousand, and i'm pretty sure they're at least close to or hit that which is just absurd so obviously, shout out to Hitch for that. Uh, I'm upset that I was pretty busy during the tournament because I would have loved to watch uh, more of it, but that was when I was on my little vacation, so I wasn't able to. But yeah, shout out to Hitch. I don't think we have too much more to say about that one because we just wanted to mention that Aix and the boys made it back to the finals because uh, at least one half of this podcast is an Aix stan. <laughs> um, <laughs> but next thing, uh, pretty quick news, but Parasite is... His roster for Challengers is officially announced now. We've already had one roster change in Challengers before the game dropped. I don't know if you saw anything about that, but uh, if I can pull it up here, it was a CDL Intel tweet. It was like Assault's team. I think he's teaming with Silly, maybe, or like a bunch of... He was teaming with somebody's name I recognized, and they already had a roster change. I think like Exceed in them. And it was already announced yeah. the first roster change of Challengers, which is just absurd. Right. I mean, but... who was it? Did you see it? Do you remember who it was? Uh, It was some you know, middle tier hype team, I think. I don't know. It wasn't anything that I was, uh, you know, going to, it was just funny to see. And then like, uh, I think crone, like from his personal account was like, man, we still have like three day, three days or three, whatever. And, and then, uh, or, you know, 10 days until, um, 
until Vanguard drops and we already have a, <laughs> the, the first roster move. It was just kind of funny. Um, yeah. But yeah, this Parasite team uh, teaming with, uh, he just announced today, teaming with Diamond Con, Exotic, and Royalty. Yeah, solid team. Yeah, so I mean, you know, Parasite, like uh, like Death and Taxes, Parasite's playing in Challengers. Um, Going to probably be on a top four team. <laughs> yeah, until he until this team breaks up after the first week, and then yeah, you know, Parasite's bouncing around to nine other teams before the first Elite Cup yeah. or whatever. I don't know. This is a good team, though. I mean, if they stick together, I don't see a way that they're not going to be one of those top teams. If there's another like Elite series this year, they'll be in that and probably finishing towards the top. I mean, you got you got Royalty, who's been was a mainstay pro for a number of years, and honestly, I think it's kind of screwed because of his come up. He came up on. Actually, nobody talks about it, but 100 Thieves got a team in Black Ops 3, and he was part of the team that qualified from relegation, and he was, like, the only player that had thumbs on the team. <laughs> Everybody else on the team was horrible, and he, like, hard carried them, and he's actually a really good player. He just kind of got screwed by the initial reputation of his team just being horrible. Exotic, another mainstay pro for a number of years, really good. Obviously, we know Diamond Con. This will be a good team, but like you said, probably going to break up in a week like all the Challengers teams do. But if they stay together, I could see them being a perennial winner in Challengers. It's basically my thoughts on it. But yeah, I would. I would agree. Together, probably not. All right. Next piece of news we had another kind of minor one, but Dylan Cod is apparently back. Says zero. Uh, zero tweeted something about just basically he heard from the kid himself that Dylan Cod is back. So I mean, I'm assuming this doesn't mean that he's on like London or anything or any like Paris roster, but. I'm assuming that means he's going to play Challengers. I don't even know if he's still located in NA or if he's over in EU. They literally said nothing else about it, but apparently he's back, which I mean is good to see because obviously out of the Black Ops 4 year, we thought he was one of the up-and-coming top young players that we were going to see in the CDL. We thought he was going to be a mainstay MVP candidate for years after his MVP performance in Black Ops 4. And MW wasn't kind to him besides the champs placement, really. And then obviously Cold War wasn't kind to him at all. And he was benched and wasn't playing well while he was in. So I guess interested to see if he's in whether NA or EU, if he can bounce back. Because a player of his caliber that we saw in Black Ops 4, we would expect to be able to dominate challengers if he can get back to that form. So I'll be interested to see if he's really about the grind now because we heard some rumors about maybe a little partying and not being so much about the grind. So, I mean, I feel like he's a kid that if he can really put his focus back in it like he was in BO4, we could see a good comeback in challengers for him this year. Uh, yeah, I mean, do you, uh, this is where I wish we were doing a, a video, um, format because I have the look, uh, you know, when formal's like peering over his glasses, looking annoyed, <laughs> that's me right now. Uh, I really don't have anything else to, to say. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's big news, but I thought it was interesting because I think there's some, especially with, we seem to have a, a pretty good amount of EU listeners and I mean, those EU people will stand Dylan Cod. So that's why I feel like I had to talk about it because. I mean, this kid was supposed to be the savior like Hydra when he first came up. Obviously, didn't pan out, but something I want to talk about. Kind of speaking on that same vein, though, the EU COD scene. Uh, I know this is a little before your time in the scene, uh, but Gotaga said that he wants to bring France back to glory in COD. Obviously, France was never super at the top, but in the real early days of like the Modern Warfare 3s and Black Ops 2s and stuff, Gotaga was actually, like, before EU was even, like, considered to be competitive with NA, Gotaga was an absolute phenom. Like, he was destroying people as, like, one of the only, like, great European players at the time, along with some of the OGs, like Tommy and them, and Swanee, but Gotaga was one of the top guys, uh, an absolutely massive trash talker, too, and he hinted to building his own team and trying to bring Hydra back to France and building like a full French team and bringing them, bringing them back to glory, hopefully in Paris if he was able to buy the spot. I saw this on Reddit. Uh, I think at the time of this recording, it's basically like brand new information, so CDL Intel hasn't even said anything about it. And obviously it wouldn't be this year because the Paris roster is all set, but we've known in the past that they look to try to sell the team. They let the trademark expire for the name. Something that I thought was interesting because obviously we'd love it if anybody wants to buy the Paris spot and actually try That'd be awesome. And Gotaga is an absolutely massive personality in France. I think he's like one of the top streamers. So it'd benefit the league. So I thought it was something that was interesting and could be like actually crazy for the league if he was able to get the team. And maybe in a couple of years, if Krim and Clay are gone or the New York roster doesn't work out, potentially get Hydra to build a team. Yeah, I mean, that's a uh, that's a possibility. I mean, I, I think uh, we've seen that since franchising came in, there's a lot of realities that have to be realized with like you know 
even people like Tim the Tatman is like, I want to get complexity into the CDL. Well, that might be a few years out. So, mm-hmm. like, even though you have the money, you might have the money and you have the investors, you, uh, there's just like, it's not like a lot of barriers jump right in. Um, you know, if they really wanted to, they, they might, they could probably like, you know, at least pick up a, uh, a challengers team and kind of like play like that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what the logistics are of that. Um, but you know, there's obviously other EU teams, uh, or, orgs like uh heretics um that mm-hmm. definitely have a lot of financial backing yeah uh they're a spanish team and uh I, you know we've heard that a lot of uh a lot of people are kind of pegging them with to be like the one like if we were to have expansion they would probably be the first in line european team to come in yeah that'd be um, great yeah i mean as far as acquiring the paris spot um I guess we just don't know what the reality of Paris oh, is. Yeah. Like maybe they want to stay in, but they just like they want to kind of continue this, uh, like apathetic approach to fielding a team where yeah. they're only offering like around the minimum. So yeah, I just I just don't know. Yeah, it's something obviously that's so far out. It might not happen for a couple of years. It might not happen at all. It might just be. Him being passionate about COD, which we know he is as a former pro, and he's always stayed kind of around the game, might just be just his passion talking and saying he wants to get in. Could be absolutely nothing, but something I thought was interesting because, like we've said, Paris has missed the ball, and we don't have to hammer it home because we've talked about it enough, but they've missed on every turn. I mean, they miss an absolute superstar that's literally a French player that could play for them. They missed... I mean, I know Gotaga has talked about for a while wanting to get in. I don't know how they couldn't take his investment if he's not already somehow involved with them because he's literally the most famous French COD player of all time. So how could you not get him kind of on board? Kind of like even like Ravens did with Vicstar, like one of the most iconic figures in all of gaming and entertainment in uh, the UK. And they get him on board just to be involved with the team in any way possible. They also got somebody else involved. I can't remember who it was on the London squad. That was like an odd fit, but they were super popular in the entertainment world in the UK. It's just like, it's hard to believe that you can't get like people that are homegrown in your own country involved. So I'd like to see him at least like invest in the team and get involved and maybe make them more popular, more competitive, especially on the social media side. I mean, he's a huge content creator. He could help them out with that. So something that I hope happens, but obviously it's kind of wishful thinking and probably far out. All right. Next piece of news we had a little bit kind of getting into NYSL's recent news. Obviously, the roster was announced pretty recently, but Clay was on the flank, like we said, with Crim6 a few days ago and talked about a lot of things from the team. The first thing we'll get into is him and ASIM's relationship. He said they're still good friends, like when the tweet from uh, CDL Intel came out about like the roster and ASIM being on LAG and stuff. A lot of people in the comments were saying, oh, he's gone because him and Clay don't get along. And they basically said they texted each other after everybody was commenting that. And they were like, do you see this? Like, Apparently, they get along just fine. They talked after the team about their differences, and he said they even didn't really have that many differences. They just kind of saw the game differently, I guess. It was mostly just the fact that the team's vibes overall were just off. After Clay took his break and the team kind of struggled a little bit, they just they just weren't a good team that just gelled together. Just kind of that's just what happens with some teams sometimes. Um, but yeah, I guess the assumption that everybody had that Asim and Clay weren't close is basically false, Clay confirmed. Yeah, well, we just need, uh, you know, we need the flank to continue being the flank where people can come on and kind of clear the air. Uh, and, yeah. You know, these, uh, at least it seems like, at least now, uh, you know, Zuma is, you know, he, he's willing to do a flank at any any hour of the day uh, just to, you know, if pros want to come on and talk, he's pretty much like an open forum for them, so. Uh, you know, I'm glad that we kind of get the, the air cleared on some of the stuff. Um, yeah, especially yeah, when I, stuff like people not getting along, we like they can clear it. I think we already kind of knew that, though. Uh, it might yeah. have just been like you know the 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 the, uh, the really vocal minority of people that were like, you know, Clay and Asum B, yada yada yada. Yeah, that's probably true as well. The people that talk about the negative stuff are always louder than the people that have the positive stuff to say. Uh, but I just thought it was a good thing to hear as well because, I mean, the two guys get along just fine, and that's something we thought about. But it was really a philosophical difference, which we can talk about that a little bit in a second. But 
that's a little longer, so we can just mention quickly that Dreel was officially announced a few hours ago that he's joined NYSL. I mean, we already talked about what this means. I don't think we have to talk about it too much, unless you have any mm-hmm. thoughts. Obviously, just no. pretty much a move to probably help Hydra out. Um, another thing with Clay and the team for NYSL, he mentioned this on the flank too, a little bit more about why he took his break and stuff, which he never really has talked about too much publicly besides kind of like a mental health reset or just like a mental reset for him. He said he was just overwhelmed on NYSL, which I think we kind of could have figured. He was feeling like he was the only one communicating in-game, and he said Asim really did step up and tried to do his best on it, but they just saw the game in such a different way because they have just polar opposite play styles. He basically said, obviously, him as like the slower AR that kind of tries to see the map from an overhead view had a pretty different vision than Asim, who's like just pushing all the time in the thick of everything and playing so fast. Uh, they just had a different view of the way the game was played, but he said that's not like a reason for him to not get along with Asim or not be able to play with him. He just was forced into that role because Mac and Hydra couldn't really step up in the role of like providing a lot of the comms. So he said he appreciated Asim trying to step up in that role, but it just wasn't a mesh, uh, which, I mean, comes to make a lot of sense of why they struggled towards the end of the year, kind of after that honeymoon period of being together and why they made a roster change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really... I think we almost got the air cleared on this uh a few weeks ago or a month ago even yeah uh but you know just to have it reinforced and uh yeah i i don't necessarily know if we need to like have a whole like breakdown of exactly what no. the differences were just like you know hey you know, a few things didn't go our way and we weren't really seeing eye to eye uh but there's no hard feelings you know they're all professionals so which is also something i think Clay has probably matured a lot in his career, obviously being older, because if somebody didn't see eye to eye with him back in the day when he was streaming and stuff, he would let you know. I mean, he had a couple times with Bose and the Optic teams and Nade shot in them. He would let you know if he didn't see the same way. So obviously Clay's a lot older and has matured a lot, but it's also one of the reasons why I think Clay went from his drought of not winning to winning a bunch more is because he's become a lot better leader and teammate in that fashion. Um then kind of a little bit of a meme piece of news we got. Doug also joined the flank pretty much after that. They were talking about how in Modern Warfare there was like a clip where Priesta got like towards like the beginning of Champs where Priesta got like a four or five or like an insane like kill streak with an AUG when they were trying out new weapons from I think like one of the patches or one of the GAs they were talking about. And they were trying out the AUG and Priesta was absolutely destroying people with it. And then it basically got a clip GA. They were talking about it. And then Doug posted a clip of him like popping a four piece on other pros and then apparently there was like a chat that Krim was in with like six other people and they were like Doug got a four piece with it we need a GA it immediately um and Krim was like yeah that's not right like he was like joking about it and then Doug just joined the voice call and like was screaming he's like I want to know the names of these six pros I want to call them out I want to know if they've ever gone four for four in the finals and he was just screaming about like wanting to talk to the pros and I just thought it was something funny because you gotta love Doug you gotta love the passion and it's just so funny some of the things he says like I mean you can't doubt the guy's dry, but I don't know. Whenever he comes on and says stuff like that, like, I'm 4 for 4 in the finals. Krim, you've never beat me. And he, like, didn't even realize Krim was defending him. He was just so upset. People were talking so bad on him. I just thought it was a funny little clip. Yeah, I uh, I hope they get Doug on the flank some more. I know. He's, he, he's just kind of, you know, he provides some comedic relief, but, you know, he's all he's also been around the scene for a long time. So. He knows what he's talking about, yeah. Yeah. He's been around on every facet of the scene. He's been on the outside. He's been on challengers. He's been a pro at the top winning events. He's been on top orgs. I mean, he's been on top of the content game. He's been involved with everything. He has a pretty unique perspective that honestly, pretty much only guys like Scump and Nature can really provide like being a top, like popular player and also at the top of the game for a little bit. Cause I mean, whether or not you think Doug has no thumbs at one point, he was like, he won multiple events in the game and he was on phase being like the most popular player behind Nature and Scum. So like, one of the only few guys that can kind of take that perspective. So, I mean, he's got some entertaining stories to tell. Uh, I just appreciate him. I I hope he can have a somewhat competitive. It sounds like he's got the best infrastructure for a team. I hope he can have a somewhat competitive challengers year because things are just always more fun when Doug's playing on a Sunday or something because everybody tunes into challengers and he'd be really good because it's like Doug versus Parasite for even like a top eight or something. He made a couple uh, like top 16s with a chance to go to top eight. Whenever he's playing, like, the challenger stream instantly gets a couple thousand more views, which is good for all those players. All right. You want to talk about the LA Thieves Twitter poll? I can let you take this one away a little bit for the news because I got a little rant for it after. Yeah. So essentially, the uh, 
LA Thieves Twitter kind of set up this, uh, you know, March Madness style. I think they had 32 maps to start. Um, and they were, it wasn't competitive based. It was just across no. uh, all Call of Duties since COD 4 um, mm-hmm. that they kind of just, you know, arbitrarily ranked uh, and put in a, uh, in a, you know, Twitter poll bracket elimination. And, um, the end result being that raid, uh, Black Ops Two raid. Or I don't know. I don't know if they specified it was Black Ops Two raid, but that yeah, went I'm out assuming, over. Yeah. Uh, that went out over Modern Warfare Two Terminal. Um, you know, a classic map in its own right. Uh, yeah. I was kind of upset to not see any COD Five maps. <laughs> World <laughs> at War. World maps. at War. Yeah. Uh, that was my uh, first like full Call of Duty playing. Like okay. I played a, a little bit on the tail end of COD Four. Um. But yeah, so um, obviously, like I said, there it wasn't a uh, you know these are the best competitive maps. Basically, no. like we we saw maps like Rust and Shipment in there too. Yeah, um, I mean Rust. Yeah, but, Rust was in the finals or like in the yeah, final four. So, uh, I guess. Uh, do you have any thoughts, or do you want to go on your rant? I'll I'll have a few things to <laughs> offer after that. But <laughs> to be honest, I don't have that many problems with it overall. Like looking at the first round, I honestly agree with pretty much every single one besides shipment winning over fringe is basically my rant like i personally fringe is my favorite map of all time possibly because it was a great pubs map was all four modes it was search hardpoint uplink and ctf and black ops 3 and it was like almost the best game mode for all of them i mean there's not too many times where you have a competitive game mode that's good in all three uh or a competitive map that's good in all three game modes let alone four if the game has four game modes and it was good in all four in black ops 3 it was the best pubs map um that was the one i had the main issue with because i think shipment and you agree with me on twitter i think it's the most overrated map of all time it's just a spawn kill fest and it's just not fun nuketown is by far superior uh to be honest after shipment went on and it played against london docks i think it should have lost to london docks too that's probably a hot take to a lot of people but i think london docks is also better I think everything, honestly, is pretty good, except for my only gripe is since we're not doing strictly competitive, I think that Nuketown from Black Ops 3 should have beat Raid. And that might be a hot take, but I think Nuketown is the best Call of Duty map of all time if we're not talking competitive. Like, Nuketown 24-7 is the best pubs playlist to just chill, talk to your friends, play some pubs. So I think if we're not talking competitive at all, I think Nuketown from Black Ops 2 or 3 uh, probably should have won but my big rant was on fringe i can't believe that shipment beat fringe i can't, fringe is the best map of all time and it got first rounded i, I was just in disbelief <laughs> yeah i mean uh yeah i, I guess the, you know i think uh one of my favorite one of my favorite games and just like nostalgia factors was uh you know the the older call of duty so i mm-hmm. i think i'm i'm more partisan to those um so definitely maps like uh I don't know. I was I was never a big fan of Rust, but uh yeah, I'm not either. I understand like, why it's in the final four. You know, I I wasn't think my favorite. Uh, I think Modern Warfare 2 had a ton of good maps. I think Black Ops oh, yeah. 1 had a a lot of good maps as well. Obviously Black Ops 2 has like a lot of staples that have come back throughout the throughout yeah. the titles. Um but yeah, Terminal uh got to be one of my all-time uh oh, favorite sure. maps to play. Uh Yeah, just Wait. a an interesting um interesting topic that uh you know they they decided to just do it get a lot of engagements yes. on their on their social media page so oh yeah it was definitely good for engagement it's always going to spark debate whenever you have any call of duty debates like this i'm looking though there's only two maps from black ops ones because now that you mentioned that unless i'm missing them i see nuketown be a one and summit firing range. oh firing range is on here too yep yep you're right firing range so i mean i guess they exactly. did those are probably the three best maps also, I might have a hot take. I think now that I'm looking at this more, I actually think I would put fire and range in over standoff. If we're not talking strictly competitive, obviously, if it's competitive, I'm taking standoff all day. But I actually like one of my favorite pubs maps, probably, probably like Nuketown and firing range, strictly pubs not involving the competitive aspect. They're maybe two of my favorite pubs maps. I, I can't believe fire and range got knocked off by standoff. But I guess there's like a community that is like will die on the hill of standoff being the best map. But overall, it's something fun. It'd be something fun to, for us to do sometime. Kind of like rank our best maps of all time. Uh, if we're ever on the slow side of news or something. But yeah, that was an interesting one. You got anything else to say on it? No, I think we can move into uh, Vanguard news. 
Yeah, we got a bunch of Vanguard news, and honestly, we I was going to say it's all good news, and um, you honestly did a lot of the legwork on writing the news this week, and then I was going to say it's all good news, but then right below it is definitely some bad news. Um, but the first thing is a positive. We can be a little positive on it here. We got uh, the news that Ninja was added into the game. It obviously wasn't in the beta at all. It doesn't sound like it was actually... Um, like intended to be in the game at all they basically just switched it it wasn't like a thing that was hidden in the beta they added the ninja perk which uh completely makes you have silent footsteps at all times which is obviously awesome that was a completely competitive thing i don't think pubs or casual people care about that so it's awesome to see them at least listening we know sledgehammer in the past has been very 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 good about caring about the competitive community and caring about us and making changes for us so i was hyped to see it yeah uh Ninja is a perk. Uh, I'm kind of drawn back to you know what Slasher was saying uh, on the flank a few weeks ago, where he said that you know on the main stage you can't sound tour anybody. Mm -hmm. um, it's more just based on you know your game IQ and knowledge of where enemies should be and your mini map awareness. Uh, so you know I, I think uh, Ninja definitely applies more to like S and D and you know just like the the pubs and like league play experience I guess where you don't have all the noise of a main stage. Um, but yeah, so I mean definitely I don't think it should be a field upgrade. Uh, you know you kind of had the the side of people that were like you know it makes it more tactical on when you use your dead silence nah. and stuff. Um, and then I, I think that was like, you know, when we had the we had people like slamming doors open in Modern Warfare as well. So mm -hmm. that was just a it was just a, uh, you know, confluence of sounds and stuff. So uh, I'm definitely glad that it'll be a perk. Yeah, I am definitely glad it's a perk, too, because all the time it's like the key thing for for me. I don't like hate if it was a field upgrade, but if the footsteps are as loud and like you said, the doors banging as an MW, then I hate it because like you basically can't move without it in search. And that's the big thing is like like you said slasher said you really can't sound hard all on the main stage anyways when there's a crowd and crowd noise but the one time you maybe would be able to is in search if somebody's footsteps were really loud and you can hear them because we've seen instances where people um hear others like in black ops 3 everybody didn't use it so like when you wall ran it was kind of loud or your footsteps are a little bit loud so we've seen instances of people sound horn and stuff so i'm just glad it's in there because i mean there's not too many perks you can use in competitive anyways to just I, I hate when, like, it is a sound horror occurrence is the reason why somebody gets a kill, especially, like, if we have online matches. That's obviously going to be a thing that could that could happen, like, in MW. So, yeah. I'm really glad it's in the game, especially because for, like, selfish reasons for us in League play, obviously, we're not playing with a crowd and a bunch of background noise, so people can, like, completely hear your footsteps. So, it's a great thing for League play, which is um, a big thing, to be honest. That's That's what I'm most excited for is the League play aspect. It'll be good for us. Yeah, uh, next thing, uh, Vanguard related, uh, we got the, I guess, confirmed game modes that will be at launch, so, mm -hmm. uh, those will be free-for-all, team deathmatch, kill confirmed, domination, search and destroy, hardpoint, and patrol. So, obviously, we're kind of dealing with a, a skeleton. Oh, boy, yeah. Uh, you know, a skeleton game, it would seem, uh, as there's no third, you know, clear competitive game mode, uh. I guess you know we were either hoping to see like a, a capture the flag or mm -hmm. uh, control, um, but yeah. So, what, do you have any thoughts? Do you think that they're gonna try playing you know dom or patrol or something? And uh, you know um, what? And and then I guess the the next thing would be like what would be your like you know they got to get a, a third game mode in pretty quick or else like pros are just gonna be like hey we're gonna do a third hard point or we're gonna like yeah you know we're just gonna like you know do dom or something so uh, well, interesting to hear your thoughts yeah it's also scary because that means that maybe the cdl isn't starting for a long time and could be starting really late if we don't have a third game mode anytime soon off the launch which scares me because one of my least favorite things is when the game or when the cdl starts three four months after the game's been launched or maybe even more but there was i had a tweet up here something that was pretty interesting um in regards to the third game mode they said Obviously, like CDL Intel tweet, like always, said no sign of a third game mode, uh, third competitive game mode on launch. Domination doesn't count, which if they play Domination, I swear, um, it'll like kill rank play for me because I hate Domination. But they said additional modes, including two newer ones that recently became a competitive standard and a small team tactical mainstay, respectively, should be expected following launch. I'm hoping that means very quickly after launch. I mean, and if it's one new game mode that recently became a competitive standard, I mean, I would assume that's control, right? right? 
Because like, CTF probably, isn't new. You'd probably think so. So I would assume it has to be control. I don't know what else it could be. There's no newer game mode that recently became a competitive standard. And then a small team tactical mainstay. I have no idea what that could be. That could maybe be something like one of those search and destroy modes where you can respawn that people have been playing a lot in the recent games. Something like that. But I guess, yeah, I'm scared for the fact that it might not come quickly. But it sounds like we're going to be playing control from that. I really hope it's very quickly, though. Like, when they say following launch, I hope that means within, like, two weeks. That's, like, the window I want. I, I think it should be off launch, but within two weeks, I hope it's there because the pros have to scrim it, and they have to get playing it. So I, I guess that's the main takeaway I have is I'm just upset that it's not in there, and I'm scared for the fact that we may not be playing the CDL or watching the CDL for a few months minimum after launch. It'll be, it'll be in their uh, Season 1 Reloaded DLC. Yeah. <laughs> Where you know we get a game mode as a DLC. It's like uh like Christmas and we're getting, you know, our first content drop or something with the battle pass or whatever. But yeah, just uh kind of concerning. Uh obviously concerning for the time timeline of rank play too. Yeah, well I mean that kind of goes into something that we have in a second about like the ranked play announcement. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, just I don't know, I guess we were hoping for at least uh at least something for a third game mode uh kind of i mean they are launching with like 18 maps or something mm -hmm. but then just these like core game modes that we've seen over and over and over. i mean obviously like staples in the in the in the game yeah um but yeah just kind of we're hoping to see something else yeah one step forward two steps back kind of situation like it's like, oh my god, we're getting 16 maps, we never get this many maps, and then you think everything's perfect, and of course, we're just missing a third game mode for competitive altogether. I do have faith in Sledgehammer until they show me otherwise, though. They've always been good to us for the, the two games they've made. They've been so good to us for competitive. So I do have faith in them uh, that they're going to release it in a timely manner, because I think they know what's at stake, especially if they're willing to put such a commitment forward like we're about to talk about in a second. And we can skip over the one thing we had and then talk about it after this, since we're kind of already talking about rank play. Yeah. Um, but I think since they've shown this commitment, obviously with the rank play in the works for a 2022 launch with Treyarch and Sledgehammer teaming up, the CDL teaming up to help make it, pros collabed with it um, to help make a ranked play for Vanguard. I feel like with that commitment that they've that they've done and they're willing to like put so much time and effort into it, I feel like they're going to be willing to put time and effort into at least getting the third game out in. And I'm sure if they told the pros about that, because no pros seemed shocked when it was really talked about. So I think they probably knew about it. So I think they told them the urgency that it would be to get it in the game. So I guess my panic level for now is is pretty low, but it's going to start to raise if we go one, two, three weeks without even hearing anything. Yeah, I, I just don't know about, uh, you know, I, I guess they kind of said it was a 2022 launch. Um, so that kind of scares me that they're already kind of just like putting themselves in that hole. Uh, and I mean, you know, these games life cycles are less than a year long. So yeah, it really kind of makes you think what's the motivation to even develop a ranked play if it's going to be, you know, in cycle for pretty much only as long as the CDL season is going. Because mm -hmm. honestly, a lot of people start falling off the game. Uh, you know, you're you're kind of like closer to like the summer and stuff people are doing other things so you really want to capture that like winter and like you know those in those indoor months uh you want to capture the 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 crowd there um yeah and the time to capture the casuals that only play cod for a few months is within that like opening launch time to christmas is when all like your casuals are playing that don't ever play ranked and you can maybe capture them if you release it earlier yeah, and I mean, especially also they're releasing a new Warzone map too, allegedly. Yeah. So, I mean, the player base is going to be super split uh, between like pubs and like obviously like you can you can level up weapons in Warzone as well. So it's like eh, it's just like further dividing the uh, your player base, and you know you just hope that uh, something like a ranked play would launch like really soon with mm -hmm. the game just to kind of capture that uh, initial boom of players and the uh, the interest level is at an all-time high. Yeah, at least on the bright side, though, it sounds like with the collab with the pros and stuff and based on like the things they said about the game mode, it seems like it's going to be an ELO system and it's actually going to be like a legit rank play and not just gems for winning games right. and like a rank right, that right. means no nothing, which, I mean, like I said, I tweeted about it, like 
me and ranked play is like a toxic relationship. Every year I come in believing something's going to happen and it's going to be better and it just never gets better. And then I just allow them to beat me up because I just keep playing it anyways. So for me, it's like a toxic relationship. But I mean, if pros worked on it, like I got to believe unless they switch up on the pros, they like, there's no way the pros went in. Like I think Slasher was one of the people involved for sure. There's no way they went in and were like, yeah, we don't need a needle system. Like they had to have pushed it so hard that like, you gotta believe they at least have an elo system as long as the system sucks but it's just a number that goes up and down when you play like a wins 25 points a loss 25 points and there's bronze silver gold plat diamond masters whatever like as long as we get that and it's as simple as that like overwatch it'll, it'll be good just i hope that even if it's released a little late i'll take a later release for a good system I guess, because that's the sad point we're at. And maybe that's the toxic relationship with Ray talking that I just wanted at some point. But I agree. I obviously hope it's within uh, like the first month. -ish. Like I hope early December we get it. I don't think that's probably going to happen. But that's my hope because the people that want it in the game off launch and ready to go with an ELO system, I think are a little crazy. I could see it being in the game and having like a preseason mode that updates with uh, like with the rule set. But to have it in the game like first day and then you have an elo system to me is kind of dumb because you don't know the rule set so like it's just going to be a glorified pub nobody knows rotations nobody knows bomb sites nobody knows any holds and everything is in there like obviously they could ban the standard things like uav but there's gonna be so many things that aren't competitive that are in there so like i like the idea of like giving it two three weeks while you get a map set like all set and you get the rules all set so i mean i guess my hope is december maybe around christmas time but i think i'm probably hoping for way too much yeah i would say you might be <laughs> but you know uh hopeful optimism is always a good thing <laughs> yeah and then i'm just gonna get my heart broken again and we get back in the cycle <laughs> all right next thing uh we can talk about it is the smoke grenade changes which is something that as a search and destroy purist also really interests me um it sounds like the vanguard version this is a tweet from cdl intel it's a dev tip says vanguard's version of the smoke grenade works differently than previous games you are fully hidden from distant enemies but can be seen at closer ranges allowing you to close the distance between you and the enemy and hunt them down with close quarter combat builds you got any thoughts on this mm, i guess we'll just have to see you know if smokes are even allowed or viable and search and actually destroy. Correctly. <laughs> um you know even yeah i don't know what with the whole like aim assist deal and stuff as well um but yeah i mean just seeing how certain maps play if there's any like long long lines of sight that you know are choke points that need to be smoked out or um you know i i think the last time we even saw smokes was in <laughs> in modern warfare when you know you had people smoking out like the uh the long street on saint petrograd just to like mm -hmm. make that initial cross um or i don't know that was just one that was like you could bet your life on somebody tossing a smoke there and it was like that almost just takes the fun out of it it's because like you just know that if there's gonna be a smoke you might as well just add a piece of cover so yeah and make the cross anyway but i don't know um i guess it's just more of a wait and see thing with me yeah i i'm worried it won't work obviously because smokes always seem to break somehow for all of call of duty history but I think it's something it, like I like the fact I will always say I liked when the devs try to innovate and they try to do something different. Uh, even if it ends up flopping, I appreciate innovation over just staying the same. Uh, and it sounds like something that could be pretty interesting. Like from a long distance, it protects you like if you're trying to cross. But if somebody makes a ballsy play and knows you're going to smoke it and they push up that cut and they're like close enough to whatever that distance may be that they can actually see you through the smoke, they can maybe get the jump on you and get a quick kill out of it so it could maybe change it's it might not be like this thing you talked about where it's like every time you know a smoke's going here you can't see so it's basically cover but if somebody's able to maybe find a lane but they can beat you there and get there close could kill you through the smoke it could make for something interesting i mean who knows if it'll work like that but just the potential of it could be cool and as a search and destroy pierce that just loves the game mode it's something that i think could be pretty interesting with finding different smoke spots if they work correctly that's that's like something like like, I have a buddy that I play League Play with that is, like, he will snipe literally every single round of Search and Destroy, and he's a pretty good sniper, so it works out. But having the ability to find different smoke spots, to have him play different angles with a sniper that can protect him from one angle so he can extra wide peek something, that's something that with snipers and who knows what they'll be in the game, that can make the game interesting. So I'm excited to see if smokes are viable, I, I would say. But 
obviously they're always broken. So we kind of got to take it with a grain of salt, but I guess I'd just say, I appreciate innovation. Yeah. I'm trying something new. Does that take, does that cover all of our uh, Vanguard stuff? I think so. We can just all talk right. about, we got one more like main thing to talk about. And then one of them isn't really that important. Just something I saw on Reddit, but Chino retired uh, from competitive to pursue Warzone streaming. I mean, it makes sense. This is the first time he didn't get like a substitute spot in a league. Uh, he ended up playing both times he was a sub, so sad he wasn't able to get another spot because another player that's just a very good player and can definitely compete in the league, but is one of those players that's probably 48 through 60 and would be on a team if there was extra spots. Uh, and obviously one of the all-time great guys in COD. Everybody loves him. One of the nicest humans there is. Like Nobody has a bad word to say about him. I'm really hoping he kills it in the content game. Obviously, we know he's going to be skilled enough that if he decides to pursue like Warzone competitive tournaments, he's obviously got the gun skill on a lot of the streamers that he's going to be right up there towards the top. So wish him nothing but the best. But sad to see him go because he's just everybody's one of everybody's all-time favorite players because he's an all-time nice guy in the COD scene. Yeah, like you said, another like a victim of the uh, the circumstances of having mm -hmm. uh, just unfortunate roster placements. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, wish him nothing but the best, but you know, it's, it's we're kind of we've seen this story play out a while, uh, you know, more more times than not, where you know, just these fringe players uh, wind up on the outside looking in, uh, in favor of you know either unproven am talent or yeah. you know just like newer players. So uh, you know, another guy that you know has to unfortunately uh, you know hang up his competitive. Uh, career um yeah. but obviously like you said there you know, there's still a competitive itch with uh you know warzone if he does choose to pursue like you know the competitive tournaments and stuff mm -hmm. but obviously streaming is a very lucrative career as we've seen so hopefully he can uh find success there and also like he's a player that in his time in the cdl he got a chance to play both years honestly the lag team this year was terrible anyways but he was one of the best players in their team. And for a little bit when he first came in, they definitely improved and started winning some matches. He improved them. When he came into Optic in year one in MW, like they instantly got a second place. They almost won a tournament the second he came in. Like both times he came in, he at least slightly improved his team and showed that he could hang. Both times he hung just fine. Like it was good to see. And he's also, uh, I talked about this, I replied to him and just obviously congratulating him on his career when he posted his retirement video. But He's also part of one of the greatest storylines. I mean, that team, Kenny was coming off of not being able to play because he was too young in the previous titles. Theory was like everybody was telling him to retire because he was washed and he never won a tournament and he'd been playing for so long. Chino was like a nobody who'd never really been on too much, uh, too many good teams. And then who was the other player on that team? Uh, Accuracy was also a guy that had really never been on a great top team, was a young player. And like everybody was like, this team sucks. Then like the two case came out in World War II. And they started winning all the online tournaments. People were like, oh, whatever, it's just online. Like, they're not going to do this on land. And then they started the year winning back-to-back -back tournaments. And Chino said, like, he was struggling for money. And, like, his parents were kind of like, they believed in him. But they were like, I don't know if this is a viable career because you're not making a ton of money. And then they went back-to-back -back tournaments. He wins an MVP. Uh, it's something nobody can ever take away from him. He's a tournament MVP. He won back-to-back. -back. Like, one of the coolest stories in history, like an underdog story of four guys who were just not supposed to be great players nobody thought that they were a real team when they were online winning all these games everybody's like yeah whatever they're they're not gonna do it when it gets to land and they went back to back one of the all-time great stories in competitive and they'll always have that uh to look back on so shout out to Chin. wish him nothing but the best and we know he's gonna kill it one of the all-time nice guys he's got all the connections in the world because of that mm -hmm. all right the next thing we don't have to talk about too much i just saw it on reddit and thought if we were looking for more news to talk about it'd be something interesting it's an unconfirmed mw2 uh obviously the 2022 version i hate that they're renaming all these games the same as the old ones because you have to say modern warfare 2019 and modern warfare 2 2022 like just come up with a new name but it's a leak from a pretty reliable dev obviously unconfirmed and not 100 percent true at all but it says the game could have a new third game mode kind of like a campaign with like morality choices and like kind of like gta where your morality gets affected uh, while you're playing it, and then a new Warzone map featuring like a combination of a bunch of MW2 maps, which that's honestly the main reason I just threw this in the news section was because I thought you being like a big MW2 and older game guy, that could be something. And I know you like to play Warzone a lot when it was first out, uh, mm -hmm. so I thought that'd be something you might be interested in, like a combination of a bunch of MW2 maps. Yeah, I don't know exactly 
what that would look like. Uh, obviously, we don't even have the new like Warzone Pacific map no. out yet. So, uh, but you know, they they did keep Verdansk in for two titles. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's like with developing and kind of like debugging a, an entire Warzone map for like you know 150 200 players. Uh, that that you know that's no like small feat to no. accomplish. So. I'm wondering if they're going to, you know, how soon that would come in, if it is a true leak, um, or, you know, if, if Warzone Pacific is just going to be like a one-off thing for this World War II game. So, I don't know, just kind of interesting to, uh, well, I guess we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, and I will say I'm not going to probably play more than an hour of Warzone this year. It's never been my thing, but I appreciate the Warzone Pacific from the pictures I've seen. Like, there's a lot of color to it with like the water and stuff. And I'm always for vibrant maps. So I, I hope the new map has a lot more color to it because it's not ever fun to just play a dull map when you're running around. So I do hope the map's cool for obviously all the Warzone players, but I'm probably not going to touch it myself because I'm just not a Warzone person. All right, though. You ready to move on to our other segment? That's all with the news we had to cover. Yeah, I'm ready. So this segment's you're probably going to be like the old takes exposed. Uh, you're going to look back and we're probably going to both be terribly wrong because uh, we might go bold on a few of them. But we're going to do a way too early predictions uh, for the CDL and Vanguard. I think we might revisit it maybe closer to the season. Like we might do a early predictions that are closer once we've seen maybe some players play the game. We've seen some scrims and stuff. Like maybe two weeks before the season starts, we'll come back and actually make like new predictions for like who he's, who's going to win MVP, what's like the actual standings going to be once we've seen more teams play, because it's pretty hard now to be like, here's what the standings are going to be, like completely 1 through 12. But closer to the season, we'll probably do more official, thought out, longer like thoughts as to who's going to win, who's going to be MVP and stuff. But we want to do way too early predictions uh, and then maybe go back and check them out middle of the season uh, or sometime after Vanguard and see like how close we were the week before Vanguard dropped if we got even anywhere close. So we'll probably revisit these in a couple months when the CDL is going to start, but we'll do a quick segment now of it. Uh, first one that we want to talk about, our predictions for the third game mode. This is probably the easiest one to predict of the list we have, would you say? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Uh, I mean, if everything goes as planned, but we know that doesn't yeah. happen. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Because with the, their tweet saying it's a recent uh, like game mode that's become a staple, I would assume my me my prediction is going to be control i wish i kind of wanted ctf again just to see if i can make a good ctf game but uh, i want ctf so Um, do i i don't think it's gonna happen though i don't know we'll see i mean (laughs) it'd be hard to imagine ctf just not being in the game at all like it seems like that's been a pretty uh at least in like the boots on the ground games it's been a staple has Uh, it been though in like the like it didn't come into know. Cold War later in the game, and then same with MW. I don't yeah. think it was in there, like right uh, away. I mean, I, I don't know. Just like you, you think of like I don't know. Maybe I'm just thinking of like the last uh, World War II game we had. Uh, yeah. So I don't know. I'm just hoping that you know we'll see it. But you know, it, if they get control right, obviously control proved to be a really uh, fun game mode in. Uh, cold war so Mm -hmm. you know i don't know if i'd be upset it's just like just uh you know i don't know i i think you know we have this idea of what a of a what a great competitive ctf matches and uh you know it's just like sometimes they just struggle to to make that a reality in the way the game plays but yeah i think yeah i mean if it was my choice we're strapping on jetpacks we're playing uplink but uh i think if I had to make my prediction of what we're going to get, it's control. What I want is CTF. I think the reason they go with control though is because it's just safer. Like CTF is very easy that if you have bad maps for it, it becomes kind of like World War II CTF where it was super boring to watch, super stalemate heavy. And just like if a team rallied off three straight captures, like there was no such thing as a comeback. So it's basically like watching Dom from MW. Like you were just waiting for the game clock to run out and praying it would go faster because the game was already over. So I think they go with control is my prediction because it's just safer. Like it's even like Cold War control wasn't nearly as good as Black Ops 4 control was, but like it was still viable. It was still decently fun to play, decently fun to watch. You could have some big moments and it's hard to really screw it up. Like it's pretty much guaranteed to be at least okay. Where CTF, I think has higher ceiling. It could be a lot better than control, but also has a lot lower floor. So I think they just play it safe and go with control. 
my that's my prediction. Mm-hmm. You on the same page? Yeah, I would I would say that control is probably just a safer a safer bet. I mean the uh, the a good amount of competitive control maps in uh, in Cold War. So I mean you know there there was a lot of uh, it did come down to the point where like a really good control team would would take the day, you know, because they'd be able to flip that, you know, crucial third game. Yeah, they were the one one of the first two. Yeah. They get a 2-1 lead and boom. Yeah. Exactly. All right, next thing we want to talk about, I'll let you go first on this one because I'm obviously really passionate about this one, but will there or will there not be snipers allowed in Search and Destroy? Um, I don't know. I would... I would say I would hope so, just because like y- you'd think that you know it's a World War II game, so we're gonna you know it's gonna be all like bolt action, um, but you know it really depends on if they cater to the you know like the uh, you know the casual player with how effective the snipers are because like we we saw like cold uh, cold war snipers were like you know almost hit scan and. You know, it was like some people could, you know, mod those snipers up to be like, you know, just like instant, like instant kills. And I don't like know. Dashy and Sim could run around and go like even in a respawn against pros. <laughs> yeah. So, like so OP, yeah. I don't know. I, I would lean to say yes, but it wouldn't surprise me if they just like nick snipers again. Yeah. See. If it's me and what I want, even if they're OP, I'm keeping them in because of the entertainment value. Uh, I think Search and Destroy is old. like one of the most boring searches ever to watch this year without snipers. I might even venture to say it was the most boring without snipers. But I think that it's most likely that they will be in because I think a lot of pros also realize how boring it was to watch and a lot more boring to play. So I think unless they're absolutely completely and utterly broken like they were in Cold War, I, I think they'll be in the game because I think they're going to be more willing to keep them in, even if they're slightly broken. And from what we saw in the beta, like a lot of pros were saying, like, I don't know if there was aim assist on them again. Cause like for the longest time there, we were in a stretch from black ops three all the way up through MW, I believe where there was no aim assist on snipers. And then this past year, they just randomly put it back in like in black ops three and four, there was no aim assist, which made it a lot better because I mean, especially at the pro level, I mean, if there's aim assist, those guys like dashy and simp are not missing a shot. Um, so I think they will be in, and it doesn't sound like there is OP from the beta, is what people said. So, I mean, my prediction is yes, and it's also probably me trying to speak it into existence, because <laughs> I really want right. that. Right, right. But I'm going to say yes. I mean, as we get... This will be one that will basically be ironed out. Like, we'll know when we do our, like, actual, like, official uh, Vanguard predictions for the season, like, when we actually know a lot more about the game and, and see how teams play. We'll probably basically know, because the GA will be out by then. But it'll be interesting to see. My early prediction is yes, I think we're going to see snipers. Do you agree, or you disagree? No, I said yeah. I yeah. I would I would think so. That's what I'd think. All right. Next thing. What do you think the format of the league is going to be? Do you think there's going to be any changes made? Are we going to see basically the same thing? Uh, this is obviously like a super super loaded question because like if it's a super big change, it's going to be almost impossible to predict. But I guess I would say I think we're probably going to see roughly the same format uh, as we saw mm. last year with the majors and like regular season type matches. I think they might like switch the schedule. Maybe it won't be five to a major every time. There might be more or less majors, but I think it'll be more or less the same with like regular season seeding into pools where you have majors and then eight teams make the chances. I think it'll be kind of like generally the same format. Yeah, I would I would say we're going to have a, another like, you know, online league matches, but majors yeah. on LAN. Um, I just don't think that it's viable to have every single match played to be on LAN. Uh, especially, you know, if you have to, you know, seed teams for majors, unless you go back to like the Modern Warfare home stands or something, where it's just like arbitrary matchups. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I, I would, I, I think if we get five major lands and then champs on land, I think that's a really successful year. Yeah, I would think that that's probably what we're going to see is online matches, unless the pros can agree to do something like the Columbus Studio, where they all go to one location to play the land matches. But I don't think that's also the way the league wants to run it because they made city locations for a reason to move them around. So I don't know. I think we're going to maybe 
my maybe if I was to make a bold prediction, we might see like a mix of regular season matches online and traveling. Like maybe every other week they go to like a venue for regular season matches if they're going to do it that way. Like they have like a LAN, an online weekend, and then a LAN, and then the LAN tournament or something. I could see maybe, but I think in general, yeah, I agree. Probably online regular season matches to majors on LAN and champs on LAN. Same format for teams making it, probably same points format. I guess I don't really, I haven't thought about it, but maybe they'll switch the points format out to make it. Uh, something where you're not eliminated by major four, like the start of major four, like we saw last year. Maybe they'll do something because I think they definitely saw that as a problem where they basically knew the eight teams for the last few months. So maybe we'll yeah. see the automatic bids thing that we talked about. Maybe they'll yeah, work that I in mean, somehow. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get bogged down too much. I, we, you know, we had a big ado about this uh, a few weeks yeah. ago with our whole, you know, what what the format should be. Um, I just think like. You know, the one thing that's kind of holding them back is, you know, every match has to have its own dedicated time slot because it's franchising. Mm -hmm. Like, we can't be running, like, you know, four streams at once because then you'd be, you then you'd really be able to run, like, lands and stuff and have, you know, just like, hey, what match do you want to watch? Because there's four going on at once, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they only had single matches going on at the Columbus studio, too, with 32 teams. But, yeah, I get the idea. Right, it's it's just um, tough, yeah. With especially them having tried to have like have the matches every week, you can't have the two weeks off like you used to because there's two groups of sixteen. But yeah, we don't have to talk too much about this because we've talked so much about format and that other podcast right. and stuff. Right, we can move on to the next thing, which is a lot bigger of a topic. Um, who do you think is going to be the CDL MVP this year? Obviously, like we said, we're going to go back and make official predictions. But these are our way too early ones. Who do you think is going to be the CDL MVP this year before the game is launched? Who's your prediction? Uh oh shoot. Hmm. Um I'm gonna say There's the easy pick and it's like do I wanna go the easy pick or do I wanna go a little bold? <laughs> uh I'm gonna say Celium. Celium, okay. That's a good pick because it's not like the super obvious one, but also I obviously think I, very I think realistic. I, know, I think I know who you're gonna pick though. You do know who I'm gonna pick because it's way yep. too easy to pick Simp, so I don't wanna do it because like it's such a cop out answer. So I don't want to pick Simp, but like if I had to like gun to my head, like I'd die if I don't pick the MVP right, I probably would pick Simp. Because I think it's most likely like you he's pretty much the one guaranteed to be the best player. I kinda wanna pick Cammy, which is who I'm assuming you think I was gonna pick. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know that I think Toronto is gonna be like for sure top three again this year. Like with the fact like the rumors of them almost breaking up, I kind of think they might struggle a little bit and like maybe they'll finish like fifth or sixth in the regular season still make champs still have a good year but i don't know that they're going to be like a top team so i don't know if it's going to be cammy but i think my way too early prediction before we really like see everything i think i will pick cammy to go kind of bold because i think he's obviously in the race but i feel like people are early going to pick simp and over him i feel like a lot of people are going to say somebody like shotzi could potentially be an mvp again this year because if that um, Optic Dallas team performs to the level that some people think they could. They could be one of the top, like big dogs in the league, top two, top three team. And if they are at that level, shots he's probably gonna be the catalyst. But I think my early prediction is Cami. I would say because I think he's the most impactful player, and I think people are finally realizing that. So if he goes off, I think the narrative will kind of be on his side because I think it'll be tough for a player to win back to back, just because for the fans it gets boring and they'll push the narrative of somebody else winning it i think i think people just get bored with constant success you see it in all leagues like people that probably should win an mvp don't win it because people are bored of them being on top for so long mm -hmm. so i i think we're gonna get voter fatigue with with simp but i think right he's he's probably the best pick but i like the fact that you went uh with somebody different and i'm gonna go with somebody different as well but i think selium and cammy are both very realistic options i don't think we're gonna look on look back on this one it may not be the correct pick for either of us but i don't think we're gonna look back and be like oh my god old takes exposed we were so far off like i, I wouldn't be surprised if both those guys are in the final five because they both were this year right yeah 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 all right you got a pick for rookie of the year i'm kind of trying to go through my head and think of like who the rookies are for sure I and mean, we've got um what like pred and sib uh paris doesn't have any and then Oh, we'll London, see London, London yeah. with Afro and Nasty and Gizmo, yeah, and then I guess Dave Patey too as well would be a potential candidate, and that's pretty and much Yeez. it. Isn't it? 
Or... Oh, yeah, Yee's, I guess, if he plays, yep. If they switch him in. I guess, technically, you could, if you have a really bold prediction, you could have Hixie or whoever. Yeah, Hixie got picked up by Toronto. He's technically a, another guy that would be in the running if he plays. You have a prediction? It's I feel like it's not as hot of a topic this year. I guess there are some really, like, sought after prospects but last year we had guys like hydra and neptune who were like super super hyped up and even fire was pretty hyped up coming into the year right um i would probably lean to say uh pred okay um just because of like what we've heard about him uh how he's supposed to be this like super talented smg slayer that you know nobody's really ever even played with um mm-hmm. he's so unknown like Hydra. yeah be, yeah because he's you know he's an apac guy so you know those guys really don't get too much love unfortunately um but yeah uh i mean it really it honestly could be somebody that hasn't even been picked up yet that comes in super early and then like just makes like a uh like an insight or standy play, like you know, yep. instantly becomes one of the best. Like he but, maybe, <laughs> right? Or I mean, even somebody that's not on a team yet, or something like a team makes oh, yeah. a, a change, like in the first stage or second stage, and then this guy just comes in and like dominates the league or something. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I would probably say, from the people that we know, uh, I would say uh, Pred. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good pick. I was thinking about Pred. I was just thinking about his teammate Sib. Uh, I don't really see a way that one of the Florida guys could win it because even if they end up being a really good player, I don't think the team's going to be that great. Uh, the guy I think I'm going to go with is Nasty, though. I think that's that's my early pick. I feel like Nasty and Pred are probably the top two picks for a lot of people because a guy like Sib might end up being Nasty or like Dave Patey might end up being Nasty, but I feel like the flashier plays always come from the subs and then they tend to get the more recognition for it. And it's easier to just like put up crazy plays and crazy numbers as a sub if you're a top level because there's just like a more distinct gap between a top sub and a lower sub. The ARs seem to be all more jumbled together. But I think I think I'm gonna pick nasty. I think it's kind of like the same thing as Pred. He's kind of an unknown commodity, maybe a little bit more known because EU gets a little bit more love than the Apex scene, like you mentioned. But I think I'm going nasty because I also think the team success might be there more for London. I mean, both these teams are huge question marks. We don't really know, but I feel like, I mean, you you all know and you know, Kyle, how high I am on Afro. I think he's going to be a top player this year. I think that sub duo of nasty and Afro could really unlock like new levels for each other. And they remind me like this sounds wild and let me explain, but they remind me a little bit of like a phase, obviously not at the same level as phase, but like with, the fact that they have Gizmo and Nasty and Afro, three just absolutely cracked players. And obviously we don't think their talent level is the simple BZ Cellium, but then they got like a veteran like Zero who's a calming presence, has been around forever, can really help direct the troops and just like keep a little bit of organization on the map instead of just having them run around like crazy. So I feel like that team has potential to maybe surprise people and find their way into the top eight and maybe, maybe get a top four finish or two or something in a major. So I feel like team success is going to kind of propel him forward and i'm gonna go with nasty mm-hmm. i feel like both picks are again are like pretty standard like i feel like nasty and pred are gonna be right up there uh but like you said i mean the two top finishers for rookie of the year um last year both were not even talked about as potential rookie of the years because they weren't starting lineups to start the year standy and they weren't even like so i guess insight was a substitute but like we didn't think based on toronto's late success in mw that he was even going to come in like too early, but I mean, Insight and Standy were our top two finishers, and Standy came out of nowhere. He wasn't even a sub or anything. So, I mean, we never know what could happen. The, the rookie of the year could be sitting in challenges right now, not even on our radar. Yeah. Like, yeah. Very true. Very true. Uh, and I'm excited because I hope that's the case because it's always fun to see new players. But you got an early prediction for who's going to win champs, or you want me to go first? Uh, I mean, Phase maybe, but uh, yeah. that's kind of a that's a stale take. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we're both gonna say like we had to pick now our early predictions phase. But do you want to just like write off phase and say who's our other team? It's yeah, like, I think I, we're both just saying like we're picking phase as our team right now until we like see otherwise in the game. Mm-hmm. But you want to pick um, like our our other team? Yeah, uh, subliners. I gotta stick with my guns from last week. It, it's. Oh. I mean, there's. I don't have an argument against you there on subliners. I mean. I want to be fun and take like Optic or Toronto or Thieves or something. I honestly think Subliners is probably the best pick. Uh, 
But to be different, I'm going to say Optic. I'm going to say Optic because, once again, of all the teams, I know I said Thieves last week is the most likely team to take out FaZe, but I've been thinking about it more, and I think Thieves probably has a better chance than Optic to have a higher floor, but I think Optic has the highest ceiling of any team not named FaZe, in my opinion, because I think Shotzi, Illy Dashi, uh, and even we can't write off Scump, is just a ridiculously high skill ceiling. I think they have the second highest skill ceiling in the league behind FaZe. Uh, I think your pick is probably more reliable. I think it's a lot less volatile. I think New York is like pretty much a locked and loaded top four team guaranteed. I almost would venture to say New York's almost a locked and loaded. Like they're going to be there, champs Sunday in top three for sure. As long as the roster, obviously, unless something unforeseen happens, as long as Krim and Clay are still there, I think they're locked and loaded to be top three. But just to be different, I'm going to go with the team that I think has the highest ceiling, and that's Optic. That's fair. And obviously, we're both picking phase, but. I think unless unless you're really picking New York over phase 100, percent which I don't think is a bad pick. But we can move on to our next one if you don't have anything else to say on that. I feel like it's just kind of a crapshoot, and as we get closer to the season, that prediction will maybe change. Maybe we don't think phase will be the team after we see some scrims and stuff. But mm-hmm. ready yeah. to move on to the next one? We have kind of a opposite end of who's going to win champs. Which four teams uh, are going to miss the playoffs if we have the same format that only allows eight? To make it, who do you think is going to be the bottom four? Uh, I would say Seattle, Demon Cats, Paris, and <laughs> Demon Cats. Um, who's going to be that fourth team to miss? Uh, I would say Mutineers. Yeah, that's. I'd say yeah. I think Paris and yeah, I guess Demon Cats for sure. I think Florida. Oh boy, uh, I really think London's going to make it. I think that's a team some people would say. Uh, I think Surge has a chance to make it. I think that's a team somebody would say. My other team that I actually have on the border is Minnesota. Uh, that's disrespectful. I mean, really? You think so? You think, who do, who's worse than Minnesota of FaZe, LAG, LA Thieves, Optic, Ultra, Subliners? I think they're all better than Minnesota for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I, I just, I don't know. I... I don't have a reason to doubt Minnesota's ability ability to, you know, at least accrue CDL points to make it. I don't either, um, but I just I look at it from the fact that I think between phase both LA teams that's three, New York that's four, Optic that's five, and Ultra that's six. I think those are six teams that are locked and loaded for sure to be ahead of them. I mean, I think London I'm high on them, but they're definitely a wild card. Um, Florida I don't think it's going to be better than them. I don't think. Paris is going to be better than them, and I don't think Demon Cats. But I think Seattle has potential. I'm obviously putting Minnesota ahead of them. I'm putting my bottom four as Florida, Demon Cats, Paris, and Surge. But I do think Minnesota is in that 7-8 range. So I think they're on the verge of missing. We'll come back to this. I mean, this might be a stupid old take, and they might finish third, but we'll come back to this at the end of the season. I think there's potential Minnesota is going to be around that 8 range, so that's why I mentioned them. But I'm putting them at like 7 right now, I think. But I think they're on the verge. That's a fair spot because I don't think I I, I I wouldn't be homering them into my like top four or anything. But I, I just don't think uh, you know, based on you know, the amount of teamwork and you know, vi- we know the vibes are there, we know that they, they know how to play with each other. Um, they have a set roster that they like. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I think they're all moving up to Minnesota as well. They're gonna be uh, I like that. But I think they're going to be playing out of that, like, uh, that headquarters for uh, version. Is it version one or something? Yeah, I think or, so. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, um, you know, where we saw that original Modern Warfare team playing out of. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I just, you know, and, and I guess, you know, my, my bias, I'm, I, I really do like Minnesota as like, yeah, they're one of my favorites too. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I could definitely see them, uh, you know, maybe being in that like Florida spot where they just do enough to hang around to yeah. make that like eight seed because there are a lot of good teams that you know on paper should probably probably be better than them. Yeah. Um, so and I mean, yeah, I mean, six I mean, teams I name that are better than them, it's almost a guarantee all six won't actually be better because it never goes the way you exactly think it's going to go. Like one of the teams we think is going to be good probably is going to suck. At least not be like a top six, right. like you think. But I don't know. I, I just think that. Like you said, Minnesota might find themselves in that Florida spot where they're eight and they just do they're the best of the worst and they do just enough 
to be in there like Florida. I think they're a better team than Florida was uh, last year, but I also think that the teams that were chasing Florida have gotten a lot better. Like London isn't, I think London's going to be better than they were last year. I think Seattle's going to be better. I even think Paris is going to be a little better, not nearly enough to catch Minnesota. Uh, but I think the teams behind them are a little better, so they, they might get caught and they might be at the end. But, I, I mean, I agree. I think we agreed. Florida, Demon Cats, Surge, and Paris are the four teams we're, we're marking up. Is that who you had, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, Florida, Demon Cats, Paris, and Surge. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think Sounds that's right accurate. to me. Yeah. All right. Next thing. First team to make a roster change. I think there's another obvious one in mind. I think like Florida is probably the obvious one because of how much <laughs> they've talked about potentially playing Ease. Like I think they're the obvious pick, but is there anybody else that comes to mind right away that you think could be the first team to make a roster change? I mean, for me, the other one is Paris, but I don't think it's going to happen because they're not ever quick to want to make a move. So I think they may be the first team that should, but I don't think they're going to be the first team that will. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, there's been some, like, you know, at least a hypothesis that the uh, the three young guys on Seattle could push out accuracy pretty mm-hmm. quickly. Um, I just, I would say that probably, probably wouldn't be the right move. Um, you know, just based on, you know, what we know accuracy's value is to a team. It might not be like, you know, he might not be like the cold hard slayer, but, you know, he's going to be, you know, mentoring and bringing in, you know, his philosophy on how the game should be played. Uh, so that would probably not be a great move, but it wouldn't no. surprise me if they just like oust him and bring in some challengers. They are. Yeah, that um, won't surprise me either. I would probably say Florida, though. That that that'd be my bet. And yeah, I'd agree. Florida is definitely, I feel like, the obvious pick because they talk so much about how they want to play Yeez. So it it seems like the right pick. It's it's not only obvious but also probably right uh, and the correct pick. But I guess just like looking through the teams here, I mean, you've got your obvious ones that you don't think are going to make a change very quick. Um, I think the Seattle take is also pretty accurate. I think that accuracy could be could be out pretty quickly because, like you said, three young players if they if they struggle to find success early, they might get annoyed with accuracy's kind of general mentality and like want to out him for a young player. And um, their coach Phoenix has a lot of history with some of the challengers teams. Like I could see him trying to bring in a guy like Gravity or somebody from uh, the challengers team because he's so connected with that. Uh, I think a dark horse team to make a change once again could be like Toronto because we never thought it was going to happen last year with them coming in, but they picked up an absolutely disgusting challengers player. And maybe if they struggle a little bit early on and the chemistry is not there like it was, like maybe there's a little fallout from last year, they're a dark horse team to potentially do it. I mean, you think that's crazy or I mean, I'm not predicting them as my team, but I think I think they're like a team that you wouldn't expect that could be a dark horse. No, it's definitely possible. I just would probably not bet money on that. I wouldn't, yeah, not to be the first team, but <laughs> I mean, I didn't think they were ever going to make a change that quick last year. I thought it was going to happen, but I didn't think it was going to happen as quick as it did. Uh, I think Florida is probably my pick, but I, I'm actually going to go Demon Cats as the first team to make a change. Obviously, that could be completely changed if the roster actually doesn't come through, but with the current rumor roster, if it ends up being a game where we see like a, a three-sub meta, which is basically every Call of Duty except for the last one, I think that they might struggle with their pacing. I think Methods and Paul might be too slow to play together. And I think they might pick up somebody with some more speed and like more of a third sub and maybe allow a guy like TJ to play the flex if he has to or something if they want to speed things up. So I think Demon Cats is another good pick. Uh, they, I mean, especially last time we saw Methods kind of have a team of his own in Black Ops 4, they made like a thousand roster changes. So I think he's probably going to be the one kind of running the show there as a player. So I think I'm going to pick Demon Cats as my initial pick, but I definitely think the Florida pick is good as well because they literally have the guy waiting already. They're the one team we know that has the guy waiting to come in. Yeah, yeah. All right. Next one, kind of along our bottom four, who do you think is going to be the dead last team? I I might just, like, if I wouldn't have said earlier, I might have said Minnesota just for fun to see if you'd freak out. Um, But... You got an idea of who your last place team is going to be? Obviously, it's going to be one of the four teams that we both said is going to miss playoffs. I want to say Paris. 
Yeah, I think I agree with you. I kind of want to go Florida to be bold, but I think they just have so yeah. much more talent than Paris, like overall. I think like Skies and Big Wake are going to have enough hero performances like to win them enough matches that they won't be down there. So I'm going to go Paris as well because I just think they have the lowest ceiling. I don't like see a way. I, don't, I just don't. Of all these, I mean, tell me if you think this is wrong, but I see like, I'm not saying they're going to make it, but I, I see a way that Seattle could find a way into like the top eight. I see a way that Florida could. I even see a way that the Demon Cats could if everything went completely right for them. I just don't see a way that Paris could ever make it into the top eight. I think Demon Cats and um, Florida and even Seattle are long shots, but I see a possible world where their roster works there. I just don't see a way that this rumored Paris roster works to get themselves into the top eight, which is why I'm going to also put them in last. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with that. It's just like there's on every other team, like Florida with Skies and Big Wake, like we said, you've you've got a little bit of. Uh, I feel like you've got a little bit of a chance, like with some potential to cause some upsets and I mean and all these bottom teams surge like you talked about your rookie of the year is on that team like they've got potential to maybe maybe make a little bit of noise I, I think Demon Cats even they're kind of in that Paris boat too where they don't have like a young superstar but I feel like between Vivid and Methods and Paul and even Tej, like these are like a little bit more of a team that makes sense and like between Paul and Vivid maybe guys that have a little more superstar potential and on Paris I just see none of that you ready to move into our last one, our last way too early prediction? Yes. We got how many pros will retire sometime during or after Vanguard and before the next title? Obviously, this is kind of a tough one to predict because, I mean, I would have never predicted as many as we saw in this past year. Like, it was an absurd amount. But do you think it's going to be kind of another purge this year of getting a lot of the older fringe players out? I think there's a chance it's less because... I feel like one thing coming to this year is we couldn't believe that all the LAG guys still got a spot. And now I think right every single one of them from the beginning, Silly Assault, Apathy, um, I guess Vivid was on the roster to start, but then like guys like Cheen, they've all kind of been purged from the league. So I think it'll be less than last year. Uh, do you agree or you think it'll be more? I would say probably like four to five. Okay. Um. I don't have the tally of like all the people that, you know, were no. technically pros that, you know, I are like, you know, either not technically playing challengers yet or whatever, but I would say like from people that we consider pros that like announce that they're going to hang it up and like move to streaming or Warzone or something like that. I would say it's probably around 5. Yeah, I would agree. Probably like four or five maybe if you're including a couple like top challengers i could see more i could also see like i think it's gonna be four to five players that are just like fringe players that end up deciding it's like not for them or they're going to be forced to challengers but i could also see a world where it becomes more because like Maybe if Clay and Krim, I feel like there's a lot also retire, like still while they're able to compete. But yeah, I'd agree. I'll I'll say like if we're including challengers players somewhere around like six, because I could see guys like Parasite and veterans like that if we're counting them retiring. Um, maybe Doug will retire for like the sixth time if we consider him still on that level. Uh, this is such a hard one to predict though because there's so many variables to it. But yeah, I think we're gonna see like. Another like little mini purge where we see a lot of the OGs retiring. Maybe like yeah, six, six, seven of the OGs retiring. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's just that's a tough one, and I, I, I mean, I hope it's zero because I'd like to see them all around the scene and getting some expansion. But even if we're counting guys like Mox, Silly Assault, I think they could all retire like pretty quickly. Um, but. I think that's all for our early predictions. Unless you've got anything else to say, we can move into our down bad sports moment of the week and kind of wrap things up. Yeah, I don't really have a, too much else. I, I mean, obviously, we'll revisit this. Uh, you know, we'll we'll plan to revisit our you know our thoughts uh, progressively throughout the season just to see uh, you know how right we were. It'll kind of be a, a, a fun retrospective look. 
Yeah. And we all take expose ourselves. And I mean, I'd also like to do one like a week before the season when we have a little more information. I'd love to do right. a, like predictions for the year, like actual full in depth standings. Yeah, and stuff, yeah, yeah. But for that's sure, obviously sure. just a crapshoot at this point, like guessing on rosters on paper. But you got a down bad sports one of the week. I think everybody knows what mine is. Uh, yeah, I mean, mine, um, I'm a big Michigan sports fan. <laughs> uh, you, you, uh, being that the, uh, the university of Michigan, I did not attend university of Michigan. Uh, I attended Marquette university, but, uh, yeah, we don't, uh, Marquette does not have a, uh, a NCAA football team. So, you nope. know, I've, I've naturally been a, uh, Michigan university of Michigan fan, um, you know they brought Jim Harbaugh in, uh, yeah, you know a pretty polarizing head coach figure. Um, you know he's done nothing to make himself less polarizing. Uh, That's for sure. But you know he's, uh, you know, yeah, just totally failed to progress the team, uh, the program to where it was kind of promised to go under his leadership. Um, yeah, I don't want to go into all of the detail or, you know, all mm-hmm. of like the, the history, but like, just like not beating, not winning a meaningful game against Ohio state since like, you know, the, the Bill Clinton presidency, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh which is something you, know, you gotta do they, if you're a Michigan head coach. They've really struggled to beat Michigan state recently too, which is like our biggest mm-hmm. in-state rival and, you know. Some people, including me, would say it's a bigger rivalry now with Michigan State than it is Ohio State, just based on like Ohio State's kind of vaulted themselves up into like the top pantheon of college teams. Like they're, yeah, you know, you know, competing with uh, you know, SEC teams, which is like you know, your Alabamas, your LSUs, and yeah. stuff. Anyway, uh, this past weekend he lost a heartbreaking game to Michigan State. Yeah, um, that was bad. It was a really entertaining game. Uh, you know, I have a lot of friends that are Michigan State fans, and they're still uh, blowing up uh, the group texts, uh, <laughs> gloating about their win. Uh, you know, all credit to them; they're a, a really well coached team, and you know they have everything that I wish Michigan did. Uh, but yeah, so I was just super down bad on Saturday, and then proceeded to be even more down bad Sunday when my lines moved to 0 and 8, but I won't talk about that. Uh, yeah, I saw you almost break your rule. Yeah, yeah. So I you're about did. to call for Dan Cavill's job. <laughs> yeah, well, when we were losing like 33 to 0, I was like, this is... <laughs> I was not watching the game. I was uh, doing other... Th- I was like indisposed. I was doing... I think I went to Planet Fitness and just like turned <laughs> off my phone or something, but I was like, I can't deal with this A anymore. rage workout. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, interest, interested to hear what you're, uh, what you're down bad about. <laughs> oh, you know what I'm down bad about. But I actually, I was going to say, uh, I follow the Lions pretty closely because my sister's actually a pretty big Lions fan too. But I actually thought like there was a decent chance this was going to be the week they got their first win because the Eagles have really been struggling. And I was like, you know, I think the Lions are, if nothing else, going to be a close one this week because they've played so many like pretty solid teams close, like the Rams and the Ravens, like even the the Packers for a lot of the game, like they've played a lot of good teams close. Uh, and then obviously this game wasn't the case, but um, also your Michigan thing. I'm not at all like a big college sports fan. March Madness is like as much as I get into sports. I love March Madness, but otherwise for college, I'm not huge into it, but I actually was a huge Michigan fan growing up. Mike Hart was like my favorite player ever. Uh, and like Chad Henney, Mike Hart era. And then nice. even into the Denard Robinson era, that was like my team. Like Mike Hart was my guy. And then he went to the Colts and I was like so hyped. I was hoping he'd play and he never ended up playing at all or anything. But like Michigan was my favorite team growing up, but I obviously don't follow it as closely or college football at all. I've kind of transitioned to be like, I guess kind of a Badgers fan because I'm from Wisconsin, but like, I don't really care that much. But anyways, Obviously, this week I was tweeting about it. I went to the Colts game, um, a huge division game. If the Colts win it, they'd be four and four, only one game back in the Titans, and they'd have the tiebreaker in division record. Uh, and obviously, now that seems even bigger that they lost because now Derrick Henry's down, so the division would be wide open if they would have won. Um, but I mean, the game was super fun. I was sitting like four or five rows off the field in the end zone, and it was actually the end zone where the Colts scored all their touchdowns, both of Michael Pittman's touchdowns and the touchdown of Jack Doyle, so it was kind of cool. They were just like all celebrating right in front of us, which is a cool experience. I've never really been that close to the field. 
but this dude sitting in front of me, I tweeted about it. I had an angry Titans fan in my mentions. The dude was killing me. He was like, I mean, if you got your feelings hurt, just don't say anything about it. I was laughing so much about it. I was like, okay, I mean, I'm, I'm just saying the overall experience. And you agreed with me at like the NFL level. It's just like crazy. Like there was literally a Titans fan in front of me. I thought the dude was like 18, but apparently he's been like a season ticket holder for the Titans since 99 or something, he said. Um, but he literally, on almost any time Carson Wentz made a good play for something, like Carson Wentz must have harmed his family or something because he hated his guts. He would stand up on his chair, jump up and down, double birds to the crowd. He would like scream at fans around him, like yelling at him. And I was just like, dude, like you've got some issues or something with you because like this is absurd. But kind of like a crazy fan experience. Like, I mean, I get if you want to cheer for your team, but like, dude, when you're like yelling at children around you and swearing at them, like you got to realize where you are. Like, I mean, I don't think there's any sports situation that would ever make me or really many situations in life that ever make me want to swear at a bunch of people around me and scream at them but just crazy that people get that crazy about their sports teams i guess people are passionate i mean i'm pretty passionate about my teams but i'm never gonna take it out on other people so that was kind of my moment i was like dude i'd like this was a big trip for me and my dad it was kind of like a graduation trip um for college that we traveled to indy because obviously we live in wisconsin about seven eight hours away so it's a pretty big trip we drove over there spent the weekend and stuff and it was an awesome weekend it was so fun but that was just a crazy experience i guess i've never that like i always hear like all my cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff have season tickets at lambo they're all big packer fans and they've had some interesting stories with some fans and stuff but i've 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 never actually had one firsthand and that was that was my first time experience and just like an awful fan experience yeah, uh, super unfortunate. Like I said, <laughs> um, like the, the the NFL experience, and I don't know. It sounded like there was like no stadium security because that's no. like that's like not. I mean, there's a you know certain trash decorum. talk is one hundred percent okay. Yeah, there's a certain decorum. Like, but when you're like making it like not a like family friendly environment, yeah. like like when I don't know, like if there's kids around or something, and you're like dropping a bunch of vulgar vulgar words and stuff that's just like a little bit over the top in my book uh yeah i would definitely be uncomfortable taking like if, if i had kids i'd be uncomfortable in that scenario i thought the funniest one of the game too was there's a definitely like the guy sitting in front of me i think like he was talking to like he was talking to my dad earlier in the game he's like been a season ticket holder like since the rca dome for like over 20 years and he is an old head you could tell he had the old the white free jersey that was wearing out on and like I'd say probably like 60 ish years old in that range. And he goes back the guy at, at one point when the guy was jumping up and down and like screaming at Carson once and like flipping him off. And like from standing on his seat, the guy turns around and says to like me and my dad, a bunch of people sitting, he's like, man, if this was 10, 15 years ago without cameras, I would have dropped this guy by now. And I just thought that was so funny. I was like, like to see everybody around was so upset with a dude. But like, like I said, trash talking is so warranted. Like that's part of sports, like trash talk people all you want. But like, when it gets past that point and you're literally just screaming in people's faces, I'm like, dude, just like, just chill out. We're here to watch a game. Like, it's not that serious. So I thought that was pretty funny. But overall, a good experience. I'm glad I went. Uh, I've been to Lambo a couple times, but games just aren't the same when the team that's playing is not your team. Like, I've been to like Packer Viking games, which are obviously still super fun as an NFL fan, but not the same when you're not watching your own team play. Not as much passion behind it. But. You got anything else to say about any sports moments before we kind of outro things? No, I think I'm, I've said my bit <laughs> this, this week. Uh, I'm waiting for the Dan Campbell get fired tweet. That's my goal by the end of the year is to see you actually tweet something about him to break your promise well, to yourself. The worst thing they could do, I mean, I guess one more thing. The worst thing they could do would be to win like four or five games <laughs> and yeah. put themselves out of like the the top like two or three draft picks. Like if they somehow like just regressed to like the the seven or eight spot, that would be the worst thing possible. Yeah, just don't get a top tier talent, but also just not make the playoffs, which obviously Ex they're not going to do at this point. But still, exactly. Like they, it's so obvious that they need to draft a quarterback. That Malik Willis guy, um, I've been hearing about. Yeah, I, I mean, they really just good. I don't know nothing about him, but I mean, they they got to get the kid that's playing like two hand touch football in the in the playground like anybody is. <laughs> you know i don't know yeah anyway uh we can go ahead and wrap if you want or yeah 
we can wrap it up. Uh, obviously, if you guys are listening on all the audio platforms, like we said, we just hit 300 subs on YouTube. Come on over. Check us out. Obviously, on YouTube, it's just an audio platform right now. Potentially could be something that changes, could get an overlay and cams and stuff, but that might be a little bit in the future because my current setup definitely doesn't allow me to do that. I'm still working on a laptop here. I'm working on getting the PC, so maybe in a few months when the PC is here, we could do something like that, work it in, because uh, that's obviously something that would make the quality of the content on YouTube go up. But drop a sub if you guys are uh, listening on YouTube. We'd really appreciate it. I think something like 80% of the people that listen and watch the podcast are not subscribed. So obviously, we've got a lot of people that are listening here that aren't subscribed. If you enjoy it, We'd appreciate you dropping a sub and helping us continue. 400 is the next milestone for us. Hope to hit that. Um, and if you're listening on the audio platforms, drop a follow on there. Check us out on the Anchor site. Come over, file Kyle, follow Kyle and I on Twitter. Wow, can't talk anymore. Um, but that's going to do it for this one. It was a pretty fun one. I think Kyle and I are both just anxious at this point to be able to start talking about the actual game and not just speculate on everything and anxious to talk about some actual scrims and some VOD and just the game itself. So excited to get into that. That's going to do it for this one. If you guys enjoyed, like I said, leave a like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. We got a bunch of new comments last time, and that was something that was super fun uh, to kind of interact with both of us. Both Kyle and I were kind of responding to you guys. And if you're listening on the audio platforms, we appreciate you as well. Um, that's going to do it for this episode, and we look forward to seeing you guys next week for an episode that we can finally discuss the new game a little bit and actually have our hands on it. So thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace.